Welcome to the ATG Roundtable. I grew up thinking that full range of motion was totally forgive, forbidden in basketball. Only full range of motion ended up saving me from surgeries, making me able to dunk. What went wrong? What, what's the way forward? What's the truth on the matter, Keegan? Yeah, full range of motion is really the key that hasn't been understood. If we look at what heals tendons in the research, this talking about isometrics, they're starting to understand that longer positions or more stretched positions have a different effect to less stretched positions. But because we don't have this vocabulary of stretch strength and long range, it hasn't infiltrated the mainstream strength world yet. We're still not looking at whether the movement really stretches the tendon or not. And now we've seen with ATG over the course of 50,000 plus case studies that when you lengthen the tendon, under load, then it actually becomes more tolerant to plyometrics. And this is something that just wasn't understood, isn't understood, hasn't been understood by most coaches. And I can't blame them because I was one of those coaches. I was coaching for 20 years I worked with professional athletes and I didn't understand that stretching the tendon under load is going to make it more tolerant to plyometrics. That wasn't a concept that was out there. The concept of long range strength, you know, I started using that term because it's, it's like you need to think about it differently than just full range. It, it sort of makes sense, but you could do full range spider curls, which actually have the emphasis on the shortened position. That's a full range movement, right? But then if we do the, the Smith curl variation or the lion curl variation, then it's very different because we get that real stretch uh, stimulus to the tendon. And so that strength through length concept that you have been talking about since 2018, it's so important. We also need to understand the impact on the joint, especially when we're talking about the knee, but for every, every joint, how much impact is there going to be on the joint with this movement? And so we know that with these full range of motion exercises like the full depth squat, that we're going to get remodeling of the surface of the joint. And so the natural knee extension then, or the reverse Nordic is going to be even more stimulus potentially for, for the cartilage and, and the joint. So once we start to think about training, through these lenses, then we can manipulate the outcomes that we want based on the person that's in front of us. Do we want to really push a lot of remodeling energy to this person or are they not ready for that? And do we need to actually just use reverse sleds and walking backwards and, and not try to remodel the joint a lot because there's obviously already a lot of inflammation and stuff going on there. The body's already working hard to remodel. We don't need to stir it up a lot. So these concepts of when to use full range, what, what that actually does, what that actually means, what tissues we're, we're impacting in terms of tendon, in terms of muscle, in terms of the joint. Uh, this new way of thinking about strength training is just, it's a blessing because it means like old men like me get to train plyometrics and train whatever we want without being fearful of stirring up tendons or stirring up joints. So this is what full range means to me. That's freaking awesome. So yeah, you pretty much coined these terms of progressing from like short range to long range. So something in a short range, like a backward sled that can get you out of pain. But now if you want to, if you want to progress someone to further heights, we, we do have to progress to a full range. And Marcel's background is tennis. And he's also, Marcel's background is working with me online and really becoming a master of regression. So, I mean, maybe Marcel can shed some light. Like it's understandable why someone would want to avoid full range. You know, I don't want to talk about a tough subject with my wife either, but it's not the best to avoid it. So maybe Marcel can, can shed, shed some light on like, like what's the solution here for, for athletes and strength coaches out there everywhere. We've gone along with this narrative of don't lay your knee over your toe. Don't go below 90 degrees. What's the, what's the way forward? So at least from my experience with training, training in general, especially when it comes to online and Instagram, it's pretty dogmatic. People get pretty stuck in their ways of training. And I find that to be very similar with like, the medical literature as well. Uh, you know, academia has a hard time moving forward just because specifically with the medical side of things, it comes to admitting that they're wrong and maybe giving recommendations that shouldn't have been going on. So full range of motion is not something that is too popular right now. And it's been gaining popularity since you've blown up on Instagram and just kept pushing the narrative of like, hey, you know, training full range of motion is the way out. And like you said, I've been training a lot of the problem cases within ATG. And these people have a lot of hesitancy of going into full range of motion. So you basically have to find out 
what is the range of motion that they can do comfortably without any kind of compromising stimulus. And then from there, gradually accumulate volume and let the tissues get subjected to that stimulus long enough so that adaptation can take place. And then little by little, the range starts to increase. But it is a very gradual process, especially if you're talking about someone that's been suffering from, let's say, a surgery or just an active injury. It takes little steps of a stimulus, which is not going to compromise the individual so that then their body finally starts to give way. And like Keegan was mentioning, the connective tissues, the tendons, the cartilage, they all start to adapt and be able to go into that full range of motion without any discomfort. And that's been from my training experience, the way that you kind of take someone that isn't quite able to do full range of motion to then over time being able to get to that point. So basically teaching it on a teaching it on a route rather than like an all or nothing approach. And it's true that that it hasn't been common knowledge on like, how do you get to a full squat? And it was, it was Charles Poliquin putting this forward of that actually like the knee that can go farthest over the toe that can bend the best has the least chance of injury. And when I was first seeing that though, that was like pretty scary data. And Ben Clairfield worked with Poliquin more than any of us. And I bet I could grill him for at least two hours nonstop, just on full range. (laughs) Probably any of us could talk about this subject. What gems do you have? We all came from backgrounds where we were taught like not to do, not to do full range. What's the, what's the light here on this subject as a whole? I think it's, this is a great way of talking about this because for us, it's so obvious. Um, but I think in the world, as Keegan says, it's really not obvious and it's really right. hard. I always talk to my coaches and I talk to my, my athletes and I talk to my clients. It's really hard to remember a time that you didn't know something. So for those of us where it's so obvious, like full ROM, long range, short range, it's so obvious now, the way we talk. It's just so obvious the way we prescribe uh, movement. But I think there's something about remembering the time where you didn't know it. And I think that's the way that you can uh, connect with an athlete and a client that's scared and terrified and has been told, as Marcel says, by a doctor or physio that you should never do this or should never do that. And I think it fundamentally comes down to something that Charles taught me. He says, you know, he says, you have to move at the speed of trust and the ability to get someone to trust you is the ability to get someone to buy into our recipe to get them results. And the results are what speaks volumes. And so the trust come from getting the results, but the magic now of you, Ben, having blown up with these ideas is that you're a trusted source for us. So when people come to us, we can sort of bounce off the the magic of what you've put out on the interwebs. And then what we can do is put the recipe into place the way Marcella said it, whether it's in person or online, it's like, okay, your knee, you know, you you can see the video of the perfect split squat by Ben or Marcel or Keegan's are great, you know? And it's, it's like, well, well, how come mine isn't there? It's like, okay, we're going to regress. We're going to elevate the front heel. We're going to, you know, use dowels. And you can get them to trust the process that, as Marcel says, the regressions allow you to say that, look, it's not all or nothing. It's not the perfect split squat and no range of motion. It's the spectrum. And as Keegan says, if you, if you push in the short range stuff that gets the blood flow pumping, mm-hmm. that joint stuff that you come after, the long range stuff will, will be lubed up such that you can get into those deeper ranges. And that's the magic of coaching. And I think you guys, the online section, I've had great conversations with Marcel and, you know, about this, about the magic of how you guys achieve that online. I think it's nothing short of brilliant, but it's that ability to get results, which then brings the trust, which then allows all of us to sort of promulgate more of our recipe. And I think that's, that's really it. Um, And Charles showed me that. And I think it was one of those things that, when you see it first, you're like, this is mind blowing. But I think it's, it's really important for all of us who've been doing this for years to remember the magic of the discovery, because I think that allows us to not be cynical about like, yeah, yeah, split squats again today. It's like, no, split squats done in a way that someone is like, can't do them into being able to do them or a squat when someone is like with a dowel or holding the whatever, and then they squat like 40 kilos. And, you know, with the bar on their back and they're all the way down and yes, they're elevated, but you know, the magic of that transformation 
I think is so wonderful that it's, again, I think I said, I say this to my coaches, if you're sick of selling split squats and rotator cuff exercises, get out of the business, go sell real estate. And I think that's the thing. It's like, we have to remember that people get sick of the coaching because they forget the magic. You nailed it on the magic. Piece. And sometimes I look at this ATG and I go, athletic truth group, truth is such a cheesy word. Who can say what's truth? But no, no, no. That was the point of ATG. So let's break this down right now on, on truth about full range. I probably couldn't give the world's best definition on truth, but George Hackenschmidt was the earliest well-known full knee bender. Like the dude was doing stuff that now, if you post it on social media, people would be going, oh my God, you're going to blow out your knee. But he's the only documented case of somebody 75 years old with actual evidence of him jumping over chairs, 75. Okay. So world's greatest jumping longevity full knee bender. Now who comes to mind is the guy you're going to blow out your knees. They put his picture on the article for bodybuilding, Tom Platts, only he's now in his sixties squatting 300 pounds, ash to grass, full range of motion, the greatest squat longevity, a full knee bender. Now we look in the sport of high jump, the Ironman of high jump, Stefan Holm, the only guy I could find in the sport of high jump. It doesn't look like a full squat. Why would you go all the way down for a high jump? It doesn't look like it ash to grass. I'm talking cheeks to sneaks, super deep squat, like how some people go really deep in a squat, Stefan Holm. Now I feel like we're starting to get to the zone of truth. It's not something that you convince someone of. It's there and evident. And now does that mean that the truth is that the full range is the best? No, no, no. That's not the truth. The truth is that it's not just a blanket bad to go all the way down. It's not going to quote unquote wear out your knees. So the myths about no knees over toes and no full knee bend, that you can show, anyone can look at and see that's actually false. And that's kind of the purpose of ATG is like not to talk about it, but to show the results. So when Ben was saying about trust and results, I love to go back through these stories because it rehypes me up to see that and to see what our purpose is. And for me, the missing link is the ATG split squat because when people struggle with a full range of motion, usually there's something wrong in the chain. So it's almost, if you think about it, if you struggle with a full range of motion, you should be grateful as heck, because this means we have some serious stuff to figure out, whether it's in the ankles or the knees or the hips. But this means like if full range of motion anywhere from shoulder pressing to the knees to ankles, if full range of motion doesn't feel good, you have more potential waiting for you. Oh, one more thing. Provided that technique is learned accurately and under expert supervision with progressive training loads, the deep squat presents an effective training exercise for prevention of injury in the lower body and some other shit like that. I forget the exact quote, but anyone can look up those first words and find the biggest study ever done on squats determined that no full range of motion, you actually get more protection and you get more athletic result. However, in the real world, people who struggle with a full range of motion shouldn't just be forced to work through pain, but those are the people who have the most potential. Like I was the guy that a, a full squat looked like, like it hurt just to look at. That's why my, my vertical jump doubled. Whereas someone who already has a great deep spot naturally, your vertical jump's not going to double, but you probably already have like a 30 inch vertical where I was starting out with the 19. I think what people make mistakes with athletes are, and I think Keegan, I, all of you guys can talk to this. People assume that athletes are black belts in the weight room and in training because they're black belts in whatever sport they're doing. So, you know, if someone said you went into a strength and conditioning facility and said, I'm a division one athlete back old Ben, you know, I'm a division one scholarship athlete. And they're like, Oh, you play basketball. You must be, we're going to do a ton of plyometric work and all that kind of stuff. Cause you're a black belt on, in basketball. So we're going to do black belt work in the gym. And it's like, no, you have to address the person in the gym in their movement, wherever they need and with the things that they need. So the basics are key versus the fact that you see them move, whether it's jujitsu or football or soccer or whatever it is, or, or basketball. And you're like, oh my God, they move like cats on the court and they're flying and jumping. The better the athlete, the better the cheater. So in other words, they can facilitate movement well on the court or wherever it is or on the mats or whatever, even though their movement sucks. So our premise is in ATG, the truth is, we're finding movements that if we iron that out, it makes them even better on the court or wherever they are. And I think that's the thing is, is confronting someone's movement in the gym where they are, not where you think they are because of whatever level they are, whatever jersey they have, or whatever their contract is. I think that's the thing. Back to the truth point. I, wanna, I think I have something to say about that, and then I'll give it up to you guys. I think the thing with the truth thing is it's not that we have to say we have all the truth, but I think 
we're confident to say, especially with this range of motion conversation and the short range, long range stuff, that we're approximating the truth. And we found some truths of nature that the human body works according to that we've discovered over a significant quantity of people, both through Charles and through ATG and the tens of thousands of people that have done what we do, that there's there's something about this that isn't kind of a, uh, you know, you say potato, I say potato. It's kind of like, no, actually it's potato, all due respect. And I think what Ben has done, and I think he did it in all the podcasts that he was invited on, he did it like a gentleman in the sense that it's not ad hominem. The people that disagree with Ben and disagree with us, it's not kind of like an F you, you guys are bad people and we're good people or whatever. It's irrelevant. We're saying everyone's trying to help people and their recipe and formula. We respectfully disagree and think that what they're presenting isn't true for the human body with the caveat that possibly we're wrong, even though we don't think we are. And I think that's the thing is being a gentleman about it, where it's not a personal attack. It's we think we've hit a recipe that helps people better than those other recipes. And if someone presents something better, it's possible we're wrong, but we don't think so as of now, especially let's say regarding the knee or the short range, long range stuff, and these over toes for range. And that's what I think those are sort of two things that are important. Confronting the person, whatever their level of athlete or accomplishment or whatever, where they are on the recipe where we see it, the regression or progression that they need, and the other thing is be gentlemen about, you know, we're, we can be confident, but we can be gentlemanly about the fact that I think we have struck the truth on some things. And, and you know, and again, with the possibility, like the, however that is in my decade and a half experience of doing this, where it's not the correct recipe for knees, backs, ankles. Something's coming to me here that, that might, uh, I wonder how this one resonates with, with you guys, but the concept is that we're just speaking about different things. If you look at like Joel Seedman is one that people often talk about, Godot is another one or functional uh, patterns. These are the ones that people come say, what do you think about this? It, I think they're a different species. It's like comparing a leopard to a lion. Their goals are completely different. They're doing different things. I think what we have, it's, it's strength training, but it's, it's about reconditioning the tissues and we're using the concepts that were there in yoga, that were there in martial arts. If you look at the oldest physical culture, they valued the length of the tissues. If you look at the people who live in monasteries and they dedicate their lives to physical development and, and millennia have been put into developing these systems, well, they value length and they value the ability to deal with tension at length because that means you can kick in the head or that means you can be the shell in. You can live the ultimate, most disciplined life to come up with the most fantastic movement patterns. I think what we're leveraging is that mixed in with strength training and tissue quality, muscle, tendon, joint structure. That is really our aim. If we were aiming to maximally recruit the nervous system and find the positions that we could use the most weight in, that would be something else. We would, we would do something else. That's kind of what Seedman's doing, and, and that has its place in specificity of training. If you watch an arm wrestler train, they're not going to train ATG style for their arm and go and win at arm wrestling. If they wanted to rehabilitate their elbow and their shoulder and, and restore the tissue health, then they would do that. But then when they want to go and win that championship, they have to train in that specific position. And I think we get confused between, okay, this guy's training extreme strength in specific positions where these people are looking to remodel a joint, a muscle, a tendon, you know, using – this more ancient and traditional approach potentially to, you know, which is not the, it's not the modern tradition, but it's the ancient tradition, which is also something good to line up with when you look at historical precedent, like with Hackenschmidt. And then you've got people who are concerned with patterning and looking at how does a leopard move and how does a giraffe move or whatever. There's value to looking at that. It's not solving the same problem. <laughs> There's, if your biomechanics are horrendous, then you're going to break down. Like if the positions, if, you, if someone's running on the outside of their ankles, you know, if they're, if they're literally running on the outside, that we're not evolved to run with on, on the fully on the outside of the foot with a completely rolled ankle. If you try and run a marathon like that, it's going to break. Most athletes aren't that far away from ideal mechanics that that's the biggest issue in my experience. Like the, the fastest way to make a team win, I had to work with teams. I had to make them win. I was looking for the big rocks. I believe what we, we're working on here with, with ATG and what Charles is working on is, is a big rock solution for muscle, tendon, joint, health. There are other solutions around for other problems, but what is the problem that we're looking to solve? And how big of a rock is it in the picture of performance and winning? 
what becomes clear to me is almost in trying to think, okay, what's the truth about full range is that there's benefits of every range. There's no, we don't only do every exercise is full range. And like Joel Seidman has his guys use incredible control of the load. This was a principle that Charles Poliquin worked on. I would see why someone would want to use more weight to halfway. If they went all the way down, it could be tougher, but if it doesn't feel good at the bottom of the squat, there's actually a lot of potential there. And you could still control the weight all the way down and use chains on the bar. And therefore the weight does get heavier on the way up. So for me, it's almost like the truth about range of motion is that there's no secret or right or wrong. And we're almost at the level of trying to, like, if we don't identify what's false data first, it can be really hard to figure things out. And sometimes if we just remove the the false ideas, well, then it becomes really common sense and easier to understand. So that's, that's where I'm passionate is almost, uh, more on the side of making sure that we don't have false ideas and that instead we have solutions rather than running from problems and then letting people come to their own conclusions. I sent Seedman uh, Tibby Alice bars and he, he loved them and used them with his athletes. And, and there for the ankle, he did with the Tibby Alice bar, he used a full range of motion. So the more I think about explaining ATG, the more I come to con- the conclusion is that the secret is that there's no secret. We just don't want any weak or tight links, whether that's through a short or long range of motion, whether that's to the quads or the hamstrings. To me, that's the secret is make a program where you're not intentionally leaving any areas neglected or weak or stiff. And to me, that then becomes a really good program, but you still have all these factors of life and life is a risk. And so we also have to kind of be operating on the idea that we want to prepare our bodies for life rather than think about exercise as, as running from life and avoiding things and use exercise to increase the quality of life. But hopefully that makes some degree of sense is that the secret about range of motion is that there is no secret range of motion. Your weakest and tightest link is probably where you have the most potential. So what I was going to say is when it comes to truth, there's no absolutes, you know, there's, there's higher levels of truth and higher levels of falsity. So as you get to closer to a truth, you start to see better and better results. And I think I had a conversation with Ben Clarefield about this with specifically an exercise, but it also refers to training, which a movement in this case will translate it to a training methodology is only as good as, or bad as it produces negative or positive results. Like Keegan said, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, the training methodology may vary. So does that mean that just because one methodology is different from another makes the other one illegitimate? No, it just means what kind of results does it produce? And is it going to further the individual to making progress? So whenever it comes to an athlete coming to me, well, you know, this method of training is so different from what you guys do. It's like, well, these are the results that we are trying to accomplish. So if those are the results that you as an individual needs, then you should look at the results that that training methodology produces. And if it's what you need, then pursue it. So whenever it comes to this question of like what an individual has to do, look for the results. If the results are what you need, go for it. And, you know, that's ultimately what's going to be the higher quote unquote truth is the one that's going to give you the results required by the individual. And maybe Ben can attest to some of Poliquin's results because one of our big missions is making his genius really accessible and like understood by the common person. Like my goal is to meet someone on the street and like they understand that they could go backward with the sled and and gradually work to full range of motion instead of only painkillers and stuff like that. So, I mean, what were some of Poliquin's results? Fundamentally, they were, you know, hundreds and hundreds of Olympians, multiple world champions, NHL, NFL, MLB, NBA, you know, across the board athletic excellence, taking people that were absolutely blasted, rehabbing them and making them top elite athletes around the world. So the thing that I would say about comparing training methodologies is, as Charles would say, who did they train? Who did they train? And what were the results that they got? And the second thing I would say about range of motion is if you don't use it, you lose it. And it's the same with the brain as it is with range of motion. So I think that would be an argument that I would say in the sense that Egan's point about short range, long range. I mean, a step up is that it's not a full range of motion movement. So we can say we do do partial movements in our system. We do. We absolutely do. There's nothing wrong with partial movement, but it's the time and place. And there's nothing wrong with doing partial squats. 
Charles did partial squats all the time, but he would do it for two weeks of the year. And most of the time, you know, so there's nothing wrong. Like a, a rack pull is a great movement, you know, and it's a shorter range of motion. So there's a time and a place for these things. So it's not like, no, we're always going full range. But we do tons of stuff, ups, tons of step ups, right? That's a short, you know, it's not a full range of motion, but we think it's a magical movement. So there's, again, I think that's the genius of the short range, long range. There's a time and place for various things. I think this, the story goes, if you don't use it, you lose it. So that was what Ben was saying, which is a program that says, okay, well, step up, blood squat, squat, we'll hit the knee in ways that you've got it all. There's nothing, there's no reason why not. And I think that's the thing to think about, which is that if you don't use it, you lose it. And similarly, who have the other methodologies trained? And is it that they've got genetic freaks? Because that's another thing, because LeBron James, we can talk about his training methodology or what, how he's trained. Is it that they've gotten the most genetic freak person on the planet and they do random stuff? Or is it the methodology that got them to be that way? And I think that's an interesting line. I like Charles used to say something along the lines of, it's not so interesting to see Hussein Bolt because he's such a freak, he'll be there no matter what. He could do handstands and you know whatever. It's more interesting to see the guy that was 30th that came second. And that's the methodology that I think is interesting because you're getting someone that's good to phenomenal. And I think there's there's room to learn from that. So often it's not the top of the top that you're seeing and you're going to learn from because, you know, like nutrition of some of the athletes is, oh, I eat a Big Mac before an NFL game and they have, you know, shredded eight packs. It's like, well, there's genetic gifts that if other people did that same thing, bad things would happen. It does present a way forward, though, which is to get more of these results of cases like mine, where someone is in a career, had a certain amount of athleticism and then changed it. That would be more indicative than just, right. yeah, I trained Bryce Harper this right. off. I didn't make, make Bryce Harper hundreds of millions of dollars. He was already great. Did he have a great year? Yeah, maybe I helped 1%, but I'm not. But you won't find anywhere on Instagram or anything me using Bryce Harper in an ad because what was the change there? Keegan, do you want to finish this out? And then also, you know, where, where we can find you if someone is just finding out the four of us are responsible for certifying coaches in ATG. I love where you're going with that, Ben Leffield, that you need it, you need it for options. You know, you have more options when you have more range of motion. So if you if your shoelaces are tied together, how fast are you going to be? And that's what modern strength training does to a lot of athletes. It ties their shoelaces together because the hip flex is weak, the hips are tight. And so yeah, you can be really, really powerful, really, really strong. But if your shoelaces are tied together, I'm still going to beat you no matter, you know, even if I'm 40 and I'm slow. So this range of motion is is useful. I like doing handstands to be able to do the press handstands of things. I need extreme flexibility. I like kicking hacky sacks above my head. I do weird stuff, but it's like necessary that I have range of motion to get to those positions. And I find that it makes me feel much younger. There's something intuitive about being able to sit in the bottom of a squat that's joyful, that when someone can do it, they just know that it's better. And I love the way you touched on that, Ben, of not getting bored with the simple things. It is a joy to be able to full squat with 20 kilos, with 40 kilos. Whether you max out for the day or not, there's, there's something inherently rewarding. Like God is telling you, this is where you're meant to be able to go. And it's also telling you, hey, like something is missing here. So many people are just like, yeah, I'm just tired. I need to fix it. And you know intuitively, like deep down inside of you, something is telling you you're meant to be able to sit in the bottom of the squat. And there's actually Amen. billions of people out there who can do that. And, and it, you know, so that, that kind of backs it up. That maybe, yeah, you should be able to do that. And, and Keegan has been a mentor to me since I had, I think, 14,000 followers and believed in me more than I believed in myself at the time. And he was like, you know, this stuff you're putting out, like the world needs to know this stuff. And I mean, it, it's a priceless thing when you have people around who, who help bring out the best in you. So Keegan is, is a mentor in our group and he also does further professional mentoring, really just amazing stuff. And Marcel was the original form coach with me online. And so he really helps with our toughest cases and certifying our coaches. And then Ben Clearfield has a gorgeous gym in Toronto and really helps with our coaches in understanding how to be a professional, how to help clients on individual level to the best you possibly can. And couldn't more highly recommend checking out his gym in Toronto. Apparently you can stop by and just have a coffee and discuss training <laughs> rather yeah. than being, um, you know, forced right into a workout. You can take your time yeah. and even, training and philosophy. That's right. That's right. So it's, it's a friendly place over there if you want to check it out. And as always, I'm at current phase, I'm grinding on the standards program. I think we may have a neck flexion standard. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm having fun with the standards program, being obsessed with finding all these weak or tight links. And 
Keegan brought up an interesting point, which is I find a lot of fun in training when, when I'm going into areas rather than having to avoid them. It's, it's, it, it makes training more fun. I mean, gosh, what is this life about? I mean, we might as well at least have fun with our training rather than being in fear when we train. So hopefully this brought you all some value. Uh, if there's any, any pressing final words, go for it. I'm going to go start getting the milk ready. Thanks for all the amazing work that you've done, Ben. You've definitely changed my life. You've changed my body. You've brought new youth to, to my mind, to my career. Um, I was kind of over strength training, to be honest, till I found your stuff because I kind of knew everything that was out there. It all made my tendons sore. And now I, I get to train again and have fun again. So, you know, you've had that impact for me personally. And the more people that we can help to have that joy of, of moving is uh, the better. It means a lot. We had so much fun training together. Truly wish the four of us were all in different places right now, but one day we should chill out and actually train together. It will be freaking glorious. Coming soon. Appreciate Thank you, you guys. All right, guys. All right, guys. Appreciate you guys. Fantastic.